Welcome to today's panel discussion on cybersecurity in additive manufacturing. I'm Gary Mack, a doctor researcher at New York University Tandon's Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and the Center for Cybersecurity. First, let me, let me acknowledge our sponsors, the National Science Foundation and NYU Center for Cybersecurity, who makes these kinds of events possible. In this webinar series, NYU Center for Cybersecurity is hosting four panel discussions with experts from academia and industry. All of these events will be recorded and made available on YouTube. This is the third webinar in the 2022 series hosted by NYU Tandon. It has a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in research and workforce. We are fortunate enough to have four eminent speakers with us today. These panels are an opportunity for you to directly ask questions from some of the leading experts in the field. It's our hope that the conversation that emerges from these events can, insp can inspire some of the future research efforts in the area and to introduce new and interesting ideas to all of our attendees from academia and the industry. I would like to start by introducing the moderator for this panel, Dr. Bhavani Garazingham, Founders Chair Professor of Computer Science and the Founding Executive Director for, for the Cybersecurity Research and Education Institute at the University of Texas at Dallas, who will now give us an introduction of herself and introduce us to the other panelists. Thank you very much, Gary. And right, so, and thank you very much for organizing, inviting us to, uh, to uh, participate in this panel. And I'm very honored to chair this panel. And so I will say a little bit about myself, how I got here. So I'm of Sri Lankan Tamil origin and I married in 1975, I was barely 20 years old. It was an arranged marriage uh, because my father had passed away four years prior. And so my mother's brother wanted me to get married. And so I was finishing my BSc uh, in mathematics and physics at the University of Ceylon. Sri Lanka used to be called Ceylon. And my husband, he's also of Tamil origin, he was finishing his PhD at the University of Cambridge in England. And so soon after I finished, we moved to the, uh, so I soon after I finished my undergraduate, we, I moved to uh, UK in England uh, and moved to the University of Bristol in England and for my graduate education. And then soon after I finished in 1980, we moved to the United States uh, uh, again for better opportunities. So. Uh, my husband was working at the Petroleum uh, Recovery Research Center at New Mexico. Uh, it's part of New Mexico Tech. And I was offered a tenure track assistant professor position in New Mexico Tech. But I declined it as my son was a baby. He was about six months old at the time. And so I took visiting faculty positions in Socorro, New Mexico, uh, and later in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And that was for three years from 1980 to 83. And then I joined Control Data Corporation. It was one of the top three computer companies, actually number three computer company after IBM and DEC. So I was a senior software developer uh, in computer networks. But my lucky break came in 1985 fall because when you go away from research, so I was in a development environment. So when you get away from research and tenure track faculty positions and so on, then you know, it gets a bit harder. But in 1985 fall, I got my US citizenship and Honeywell won a contract United, from the United States Air Force to develop a high assurance uh, database system. And Honeywell interviewed me and they wanted to hire me. So all three had to come together, right? Me getting the US citizenship, Honeywell getting the contract and also Honeywell uh, wanting to hire me. So all three happened together. So that was my lucky break. And that was 36 plus years ago. So I've been working in cybersecurity and data science uh, at Honeywell, then the MITRE Corporation, the National Science Foundation, and the University of Texas at Dallas since 1985 fall. At that time, it used to be called computer security and data management. Then it became um, 
information security and uh, data mining, and today it's cybersecurity and data science slash machine learning. So over the years, I've learned to sort of enjoy and take pleasure in everything I do, whether it be at work or with family. And my, my goal has been to take advantage of every opportunity offered to me. So now, uh, I'm not only I'm a mother, I'm also a grandmother. And so I'm really, you know, really uh, motivated to continue with my work as well as spend time with my family. So now I'm going to introduce the panelists and hopefully they will say something about themselves and how they got here. So our first panelist is Ms. Brenna Freeman and she's a thermal engineer with the US government. So Brenna, do you want to say something about yourself? Sure, thank you, Bhavani. Um, so I was born in China, but I was adopted. And so I actually grew up in Fairbanks, Alaska. I have uh, degrees in aerospace engineering and um, from the US. And then I also have a master's degree in aerospace engineering, basically the equivalent of um, from France. So when I was in college, I worked at a radio station. I did external communications for student government and then in my professional career, I mostly have worked just, you know, at one group um, with um, NASA at Goddard Space Flight Center. So in my professional career so far, I really have focused a lot on, you know, besides my day job as a thermal engineer, which involves CAD and stuff, um, I really focus a lot on early career advocacy. And um, I also in the past have worked as part of a team being an equity thought leader, kind of focusing more on inclusion, specifically for early career minorities. And I also am affiliated with an employee resource group having to do with the AAPI community. So that's the um, Asian American Pacific Islander community. And then in my spare time, I volunteer and I teach middle school robotics, um, which is affiliated with the National Society of Black Engineers. So thank you. Thank you very much, Brenna. And our next panelist is Dr. Simona Unadi Murph. She's an IPA with the US Department of Energy and Savannah River National Laboratory and adjunct professor at the University of Georgia. So Simona, could you please say a few words about yourself? Yes, thank you for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am trying to take you on a journey today. So uh, if you can go back to the previous slide for a second, um, uh, you probably figure out that uh, I uh, have an accent. Uh, the accent is coming from Romania. So I uh, was born and I grew up in Romania, as you see it on the map. And uh, more than 25 years ago, I decided to explore the world and pursue my dreams in the land of the free and the home of the brave. So um, uh, please move on to the uh, next slide. So um, I um, came to America and uh, however, uh, my early experiences in Romania provided me the foundational values that shaped my life and career. Uh, these experiences uh, that I'm going to share with you, a few of them have a special uh, place in my heart as they helped me create my own American dream. So uh, if you take a look, I put a couple of photographs in my formative years. So my mother and I would spend um, uh, countless hours cooking very complex traditional Romanian recipes in the kitchen. I was always fascinated by the chemistry of cooking. Uh, we would measure ingredients and discuss acidity in the foods. I learned about yeast and the environments that it needs to thrive. I do think that my love of cooking uh, led to my love of chemistry. Um, and uh, to me, they are a natural extension of one another. Uh, and when I'm saying about cooking, we always start from scratch. So I always use, uh, I ate growing up, you know, organic uh, food all the time. So I didn't really uh, uh, appreciate it then, but I appreciate it now. Uh, in the same time, you know, uh, uh, growing up there, uh, I spent a lot of time reading. So, um, 
uh, I read uh, Marie Curie's uh, autobiography um, and uh, just a little bit of uh, background, you know, for those that are uh, not familiar, you know, she discovered radioactivity and named an element that uh, she discovered polonium after her native country, Poland. So I was hooked, you know, I found a role model, which was, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, looking at uh, uh, STEM and uh, science, you know, sometimes it's hard to find. Um, in the same time, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, uh, traveling with my family um, and we went camping um, and I learned how to respect nature and to be inquisitive about, uh, um, about uh, the world and be curious um, and uh, prepare uh, for, for a journey uh, uh, into nature. Um, and um, while I didn't watch a lot of TV, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, we got to go to the movies and there was a movie that really kind of uh, captured my imagination when I was in 10th grade and that was the Fantastic Voyage. And the movie is about a submarine crew who are shrunk to microscopic size uh, and venturing to the body of an injured scientist to repair damage to his brain. What was then science fiction, um, you know, today is actually reality in the field of nanoscience and nanotechnology. When we can uh, uh, manipulate the matter at a nanometer scale, um, you know, uh, we are actually uh, into that realm of, uh, of uh, uh, areas. So all these experiences um, uh, guide me throughout my career and allowed me to to uh, fulfill my dreams. So I um, acquired a number of degrees, undergraduate and graduate degrees from Romania. Um, and of course, you know, having this unique opportunity to come to America, uh, you know, uh, I went uh, and I, uh, I went back to school and I acquired a couple of uh, graduate degrees. And my career started as an educator, you know, at a, uh, uh, K to 12 or college level, which turn out into the uh, research arena. Um, and, um, you know, uh, subsequently I went toward uh, the management and uh, serving as a leader. Today I'm doing all these, uh, these uh, uh, three uh, passions that I have, and I'm trying to, to uh, create a space for, for other people to, to um, um, not just help, but hopefully inspire. So that's all about me. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Simona. And our third panelist, we have three panelists. Third panelist is Professor Nidhi Rastogi. And she is an assistant professor in, and she's specializing in, specialized in cybersecurity. And she's with the, uh, it's a very well-known cybersecurity institute at the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. And so Nibi, please say a few words about yourself. Sure, Bhavani, can you move on to the next slide, please? Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be a part of this panel. And um, yes, I'm a professor at RIT uh, representing Golisana College of Computing and affiliated with the ESL Global Cybersecurity Institute, which offers us a lot of opportunities to uh, interact with the very smart security leaders within RIT and, and world over. And it, it has also been successful in attracting a lot of talent um, in you know, undergraduates and graduate students all across the world. And both male and female candidates, um, I see way more percentage of them uh, in my classes than I used to when I myself was a student uh, pursuing PhD in computer science at RPI or master's in computer science at University of Cincinnati. In fact, I was the only girl in my cybersecurity class at Cincinnati uh, and also um, in the networks, uh, network security class uh, at, at RPI, which was only eight years ago. So it hasn't been uh, so long. Um, but I think these two were the pivoting uh, points of my career, because when I went to University of Cincinnati, that's when I moved to US, uh, seeking better opportunities. Um, not that in India it was, uh, it was difficult, but the kind of career that I was interested in, 
in cybersecurity, uh, there wasn't much at that time. There was a lot of networks, uh, which I was um, pursuing uh, in my undergraduate degree. Uh, but I've had a mix of uh, background. I've been in the industry for six years before I decided to move to academia. Uh, and uh, it has all been part of what exactly I want to do at that stage of my life. And I do not think one needs to govern what you want to do at a later stage. Um, so I've been an engineer uh, and I've been a researcher and now I'm an academic. Uh, but there is no stopping what I would like to do next or it could be an amalgamation of all of them. Uh, I've always been very passionate about network systems, security, and now, and now building AI models for, in, uh, for, for impacting security or for ensuring that our cyber physical systems are secure and uh, our data is secure um, and so on. Uh, my interest in security is kind of a, um, the one incident I remember very clearly is when I came across a concept called steganography, which some of you might know, uh, means that there is a hidden message. Um, the message is hidden, but it's in plain sight in an audio or in a video. And um, that's what, you know, intrigued me, how can that even be possible? Uh, but that's the one incident I remember which, which made me uh, more curious about security. In, I would say cryptography or information security, what it was called back then. Uh, but I think it's also, because I was always curious about um, solving, solving problems. And uh, reading uh, books from Nancy Drew, Agatha Christie, searching for evidences, it's all, I think, a com you know, a part, part of uh, what one wants to be. Uh, and I was born and brought up, uh, and I lived a considerable part of my life in New Delhi, India, where majority of my family still lives. Um, and uh, at this point, I am a mother of two kids, young kids, uh, which also means that I cannot only have uh, my professional life dominate, uh, dominate my 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 you know my daily life but also um you know uh engage in other uh activities uh spend time with the with my family and friends so i i have a very active life even outside of work which i th which i think is important uh to maintain a balance and to uh keep things interesting uh and i can say that because i've seen many um female uh, models who are very successful in academia and in, in, in industry, uh, not just chasing their jobs, but uh, also trying to build a balance, balanced life. Um, yes, and um, my favorite quote these days, I would say, and I think it applies to many of us, is that the greatest danger for most of us is not to, uh, is, is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. So uh, I would just end my introduction by saying that uh, uh, stop chasing complacency compl uh, or stop being complacent, but uh, keep growing and keep improving. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nidhi. That's a very good piece of advice for all of us. So let's get on with the questions. So my first question, if you were looking to persuade a skeptic on, of the benefits, say, of a diverse workforce, what would be your go-to example? So I have heard quite a few saying, oh, diversity is not good because what's the point? So what will be your answer? So let's hear from Brenna, Simona, and Nidhi. So if you could just answer to the point, so because I've got lots of questions to ask you all. So Brenna, do you want to start? Do you want to answer this question? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so for me, I think one of my go-to examples when it comes to, you know, trying to persuade people of diversity is, you know, the more different the members of your team are, the more possibilities you have for how to solve problems, right? So maybe if everybody was all the same and like all had the same thought processes with the same backgrounds, you might or your team might only see, you know, one or two ways to solve a problem. But if you had someone else who had like a different experience or maybe they had you know, like we'll say like an applied versus maybe like an experimental background, they could say, you know, like in my experience, we try doing this. So maybe, you know, we try something a little bit different and it might be, you know, diverging from what the group might have originally come up with in terms of a solution. So I think having a diverse group really means that 
you're bound to find more robust solutions to your problems. Thank you. That's that's very true. And Simona and then Nidhi, do you have anything to add to that, uh, what Brenna has said? Um, yes, so uh, very good points there. So uh, I would like to say if in today's society, you have to persuade a skeptic uh, of the benefits of the diverse workforce, I would say you are in trouble already um, because um, there is a debt there are decades of worth of research proving how diversity and inclusion boost not only financial performance, innovation, uh, market share, team collaboration, and much more. Uh, I would also like to uh, to uh, uh, kind of uh, um, continue the conversation that we started that uh, is really critical, for example, in when you are uh, trying to develop product, uh, try to engage different with different backgrounds. We always uh, love working with, um, you know, biologists, chemists, engineers, uh, designers, uh, computational people, uh, because everybody brings different expertise, different skills, uh, even uh, uh, note takers, even recorders, they are really important to have these uh, very complex and very dynamic teams in order to, to bring an idea from the, the, the uh, proof of concept to fruition to create a prototype. So it's really important to, to, to uh, be able to uh, uh, open the doors to uh, people with different backgrounds and expertise to bring a different point of view at the table. That's, that's really good because diversity, not with respect to men, women, or uh, race or gender, also uh, different areas. So Nidhi, do you have something to add to that coming from an academic perspective? Yes. So I have a mix of, like I said, mix of background, academia and engineering. I'll just talk, uh, I'll just put facts to, uh, you know, in front of everybody, is that there are millions of jobs which are open and yet not filled in the field of cybersecurity. All right, and uh, the age group that uh, I interact with the most is between the age of 18 and 24, uh, or 20, you know, 26, 27, uh, undergraduates and graduates. And in that age group, there are 48 to 49% of females. I just, just looked that up on the world uh, data uh, uh, website. So there is 48 to 49% of females in this age group in the US. So if we were to fill millions of open jobs uh, in security, especially in security, we cannot exclude that, you know, almost a, um, yeah, a half of the population um, because uh, that just doesn't, you know, that the math that just doesn't work. It's a, it's a case of demand and supply. So especially at, at, at my workplace, which is an educational institute, uh, what I am seeing is uh, clearly that because I'm, uh, you know, a female professor, and there are a few others, we we've clearly seen the the change, which I did not see when I was uh, in school, is that there are more female students reaching out for help, advice, mentorship, and what an educational institute represents is basically how the society is going to shape up, and the right kind of representation will encourage and support diversity, equity, and inclusion. But at the same time, we also need to we all, we also need to prepare this sort of a pipeline, you know, that you need to educate, prepare, encourage um, all kinds of can all kinds of people with all kinds of backgrounds, so we can actually do the job. So I, I think that uh, encouraging diversity, equity, and inclusion just makes um, you know uh, economic sense. That that's really a very good answer. So I see that all three panelists have come you know, had, have had some something sort of unique to say about this very challenging uh, question. So continuing, the growth of technology has affected every business, right? Even making some companies obsolete. And I gave an example. I started my career, my industry career at Control Data Corporation. It was a number three uh, computer company, but that company, that was in 1983. By two, 1993, the company, uh, did not exist. It had been split into pieces. So the question is, how are you preparing? So in this case, your students, mm -hmm. and in the case of Brenna and Simona, the, those who are working with you or for you to adapt 
with fast-paced tech advances. So here, and I've also a related question, but let's answer this question. First Nidhi and then Simona and then Brenna. So Nidhi, do you want to uh, handle this question? Yes, so what we need to first of all understand is the root cause, like why companies are getting obsolete. Uh, basically in technology, uh, be it security, be it networks, because these are the two industries I've, I've uh, been engaged in uh, the most. One needs to constantly keep uh, adapting to what is the next big thing. Uh, but at the same time, what you need to really remember is that while these changes, uh, there, there are ways to uh, you know, adapt to these changes, you still need very strong foundations. You know? uh, and they have served me very well. For example, in security, the emphasis is still on, on, on having a background in, uh, in cryptography, for example. Uh, I, I only uh, advise my students is do not question the application when you're studying those subjects. Uh, but in the long term, it's going to benefit uh, their careers, like computer networks, operating systems, data structures, uh, object-oriented programming, cryptography, discrete maths. So I know I'm, I'm naming these courses, but these are the ones, if you think about them and put them together, these are the ones which, are, which form the foundation of anybody who wants to, you know, let's say, enter into AI uh, or, you know, just become a, a security specialist or a SOC engineer. Like cryptography, uh, nowadays there are additional lectures on blockchain and Bitcoin. And like in networks, there is, um, there is a cloud computing, there's distributed network, ed edge computing. So however, the foundations haven't changed very much. So, but, but you know, if you, if you want, like with AI courses, there is an additional emphasis on learning about bias. Uh, but if you kind of understand and, you know, just take a step back, what exactly does this, what exactly does this mean? is that you should be able to understand the cause and impact of AI on a large population. Uh, for that, you need to be able to draw a distribution of the training data set and its influence on the model when it is deployed. So to be able to uh, really you know, move on to the next thing, you still need very strong foundations is what I wanna say. That's, that's really a very good answer. So let's hear from Simona and Brenna. Uh, you know, you're not in academia, but still in industry, right? It's really important. Um, you know, to prepare the, the workforce. And so those who are working for you. So Simona, do you have something to add to that? And then Brenna. Yes, I would like to advise the students to, um, to be open and uh, to try to build a diverse career. First of all, they need to be able to create a learning mindset. Um, that means you have to always brushing up on your existing skills, add new ones, uh, retrain, and stay abreast of hot technologies. Uh, cultivate your skills, not just in your own area, but also learn something different, something unrelated. What are the hot topics? Uh, uh, take you know the uh, different areas that you want to, to learn, for example, some of the, the hot areas, you know, cyber, manufacturing, uh, artificial intel intelligence, machine learning. You can always take classes. You can take ev evening classes. You can do job shadowings. You can uh, uh, take uh, tours in different places. Um, learn how to, uh, to write better. Um, be flexible and have a plan B. That way, if uh, option A doesn't work, and we know many times, you know, in science or in engineer, you know, the first uh, uh, path is not perfect. So you can adapt along the way and you can be uh, successful. That's, that's really good. Very good answer. And Brenna, um, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, sure. I think my answer is really similar to Samoda's, just, you know, trying to encourage my coworkers or, you know, people on my team, you know, to adapt kind of like that growth mindset, right? So it's it's kind of like, you know, I, I know like uh, my tendency too is to sometimes like once I learn something really well, I kind of want to keep doing it, right? Because I'm like, oh, this is what I'm really good at. But I think it's okay to be like, you know what, maybe I'm not so good at this and maybe I need to learn a little bit more, more about it, right? and to be open-minded to some of these new possibilities. Um, in terms of cybersecurity, something that's been tricky is there seems to be kind of like this push to, you know, we want to work together on documents that update in real life time. 
And some of those documents exist, you know, like on the cloud. But then it's a question of, you know, are those documents secure, right? Is there a possibility that someone is going to be able to see what we're working on? So sometimes we really have to tailor, you know, what tools that we use for this collaboration based on the material, right? So if it is sensitive, we need to be a little bit more careful about that type of stuff. Um, so in terms of just, you know, helping people, I think it's just being open-minded, trying to have a growth mindset, and then kind of, once again, like what Simone was saying is being able to make those pivots saying, you know, hey, we started out with this tool. Maybe it's not working out quite the way that we wanted to. Maybe we need to try something new. How can we adapt? How can we change? How can we kind of change direction just a little bit to try to make our end result better? Thank you. Right. I'm, I'm really, you know, glad to listen to all this. I'm learning too. So I have a related question. Uh, and so let's start with Nidhi and see, because we also want to make sure that we have some time for the audience to ask questions. So let's see. We have seen in recent uh, news, right, examples of cultural exclusion actually encoded into technologies like gender and racial bias uh, found in Amazon's face facial recognition platform and AI systems like machine learning not being fair. So what should organizations be doing differently to prevent issues like this? So let's hear from Nidhi and then very briefly, Simona and Brenna. So Nidhi, do you have something to say on this? Yes, so first of all, I don't want to demonize any company. We are all complicit in uh, you know, what the society is reflecting these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would say that, uh, which I have uh, you know, said quite a few times is that how we educate our you know, current uh, young population or you know, mature population is basically going to reflect how the society changes. And that can happen if you, if you educate them well and if you, if you, if you kind of uh, support them with the right tools. And AI has an impact at scale. We need to understand that, which was not the case earlier. Uh, but again, if you kind of understand how AI works, how the models, so AI is a very large, domain, you know, I would say machine learning is one which people associate with the closest when they talk about AI, is that if they understand how machine learning works, uh, they will be able to understand that these changes that we are seeing in the society or seeing encoded into technology, they are reversible. And a lot of it goes into how you are preparing the data, how you're collecting the data, are you putting it at enough emphasis on including um, the right distributions in your training data set. So what all I'm going to say is that uh, we have the ability to change and that change can happen if you understand how technology works. And also that what you are doing in whatever company you're representing is going to have far reaching impact. And it's going to influence a lot of lives just because AI has that ability. Uh, a model that is you know, uh, included in a Google or a Facebook or an Amazon is good excuse me, is going to affect a much larger population than any, you know, uh, uh, anything that we've seen uh, earlier. Okay, so that's that's really a good answer. So, uh, Simona and Brenna, do you have anything to add to this? Just briefly, I would like to mention that I think it's critical from the uh, get-go. Uh, we need to ensure that uh, diverse team members are engaged in the process when developing technologies and markets. Yeah, and Brenna? Yeah, thank you. I think when it comes to, you know, when we want to like give data training sets to different programs and stuff, we really need to go a little bit beyond, you know, what's like a typical snapshot based on percentages or proportion. I think that's when you bring in the E of the DEI, right? So that's equity. Mm -hmm. So the idea is like, you know, maybe there's a group of minorities that are a small portion of the US population, but in terms of equity, you might need to, you know, feed your program or algorithm more examples of, you know, that specific data set so that, you know, proper identification and classification and, you know, categorizing can happen at an equal level for that subpopulation, right? So it's the idea of kind of the classic example of equity is that if you've got three people trying to see a baseball game and there's a fence, right? If you gave them all a box the same size to see over the fence, the shortest person still can't see. So equity would mean, do we you know, give them a second box or a third box so they can see the baseball game as well over that fence? Mm -hmm. And so also part of D&I or DEI is also a fourth term called accessibility. 
So we're looking at also of these tools that are created, is there a way that, you know, a larger portion of the population can use those tools successfully? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, yeah, so if you have to think about all three, DEI. So moving on to the next question, uh, how is the industry attracting and retaining underrepresented talent? So for example, do you see any difference in the strategies needed between attracting and retaining the talent? So since I'm, since we have sort of, uh, we may not have time for all the questions I had planned, for this question, let's start with Simona and then Brenna and then Nidhi. So Simona, what about uh, attracting and retaining underrepresented talent? Uh, thank you. So I think this two part question, first of all, you have to, in order to attract the, the uh, underrepresented uh, talent, you have to be, uh, build partnerships with multicultural professional associations, nonprofits, and academic institutions that can help your organization recruit a diverse pool of job candidates. I think it's also beneficial to create a mentorship and internship programs to bring uh, these communities to, to show them what you can offer. In the same time, do not stop there because we can, even today, we see a lot of the big resign, right? Everybody wants to resign, find a better job. So you have to, not just to hire, retain, but also include and enable a diverse group of employees to do their best work. So make sure that you engage the workforce and keep them motivated. Uh, try to understand your, your uh, team members, what drives them, what is their passion? How can you open the doors for them? How you, can you help them uh, become the, the, the uh, person that they want to be at work? These are my my. Uh, that's, yeah, that that's really that's really very good. Great answer. And so, uh, let's see, Brenna, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. <clears throat> I think part of you know trying to hire a diverse workforce, there's been a lot of there's been a big push lately to try to like start with that pipeline, that talent pipeline, right? So like if you get not as many diverse people going to university or getting the degrees that you think you're gonna need. It's a question of like, how do you encourage those subpopulations when they're really young, right? So that they want to be in those degrees, right? So that they want to come work for you. And so um, I want to say that there's like a study done where it was like girls decide that maybe math isn't for them as young as the fourth grade or even younger. And to me, I'm like, well, that's automatically counting out a really valuable part of your population. And so there's been a lot to try to shore up this like leaky pipeline that you know certain industries have been seeing. And then I think in terms of retention, it's one thing to get people in the door, right? So that's a hiring diversity, but it's a completely another thing being able to retain them, right? And I really feel like um, maybe a little bit less emphasis has currently been being placed on inclusion, but if you can help someone find their niche, help them really identify with the values of your organization, help them, you know, make make friends and like get really connected to the mission, I think that ultimately will help retain, right? Because it doesn't matter how many people you keep bringing in the door. If they keep leaving, your populate like your diversity or company remains the same. So I really think it's a two-pronged attack that we need to take. Thank you. Right. So what about uh, um let's see, so Nidhi, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I think this is one of the most complex questions and I will try to answer this. Um, it says, the, the question is about attracting and retaining. And like Brenna mentioned, it's like a pipeline. It just goes back several years down the line that uh, attracting and retaining is already uh, out of hand if you haven't really dealt with representation you know, early on in our lives in training again early on in our lives and setting the right kind of example, uh, having an open uh, you know, environment where people can comfortably talk about uh, what they are. Uh, if that kind of an environment is there, people will be able to, uh, people will be encouraged to pursue what they want to pursue. So, you know, I know for, uh, from my own example that my university is dedicated to this. Um, they are they are making specific efforts to reach out to female candidates and other, uh, you know, trying to represent uh, RIT as a diverse, uh, equitable institute, an inclusive institute. Um, I think 
there has to be uh, a push from both sides. You know, uh, the society needs to open up uh, to represent and, uh, you know, to, to the diversity that we actually are. And there has to be uh, an outreach, a stronger outreach uh, from, from industry and from academia. Only then they will see, okay, there is, a, there is, there is interest, there is a, there is a need. Um, and that, that's all I have to say. Right. I think, uh, again, I see the panelists giving sort of very complimentary answers. So that's, that's really good. And so another question I have is, uh, you know, in the last uh, years, a number of popular movements, right, like Me Too, uh, Black Lives Matter, and so on. So do you see these movements affecting your own workplace? And also, what are some of the positive aspects, right? What are you sort of ex excited about? moving forwards with regards to this changing culture for DEI. So let's start with Simona, Nidhi, and Brenna. Simona? Um, so thank you. Um, I think uh, the, the recent uh, um, movements, you know, they have a, a positive impact in uh, every uh, uh, corporation um, and everybody's trying to, to be more uh, present and uh, create opportunities for, um, for a diverse workforce and underrepresented groups. So I do believe that the engagement of these underrepresented uh, groups um, is a social and moral imperative. Um, and uh, if, as we continue uh, to the 21st century, I think is it essential to diversify our perspective in STEM related fields to ensure that um, our uh, future uh, is uh, bright and we can position our uh, world toward more of a, a, a inclusive environment and also a more successful global uh, society. That's, that's really very important. And so Nidhi, you have something to add to that? And then Brenna? Yes, I think it was, and movements like these, the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter, these are movements which only have a positive impact on the society because it kind of awakes, uh, you know, awakens us to how we really, you know, what changes we must make. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are many amongst us uh, who have suffered and do not have to just because they weren't given the platform to speak uh, and to raise their concerns. And, you know, uh, given the opportunities uh, that everyone else has. So I only see these movements as uh, not just awakening movements, but also our, our, the, the unique opportunity for us, for whatever generation we are representing to make the change in whatever way we can. Uh, and also making it okay for people to raise their voices be it exploitation, uh, be it lack of participation, be it, uh, you know, I, I think it just gives us uh, that it's okay to, to raise their concerns and to voice their, in, to, to basically voice um, all the sufferings, basically, any kind of uh, group has, has, has seen in the past. And that's, that's really good answer. Brenna, what do you have to say to that? Yeah, thank you. I think something that I really appreciate about some of the social movements um, that have gone on is that it's kind of raising awareness. So it's like, you know, people are starting to realize that, you know, maybe they don't know everything and maybe they need to ask a little bit more. And so I think it's kind of the same thing when it comes to systemic racism and you're looking at certain processes and structures are in place. It's also kind of like what Nidhi was saying is that we need to you know, go out and ask people, you know, what is working, what is not working? Because if you've got a system that's set up for English speakers, and then you only, you know, test that system with English speakers, you're not going to hear from non-English speakers that like, hey, it's really hard to find this multi-language button, or hey, we, it'd be great if we could have this form in a different language. So I think just, you know, raising awareness has been great. I think now we're kind of in the steps where we really need people to advocate and be like, you know, in the historical context, who has you know historically been left out of these type of conversations, and how can we build in processes to include them more to create a better product in the future? So yeah, yeah. I'm really pleased to hear all the answers from you all. So another somewhat related is that we've been working right at, from home the last two years uh, with COVID, and so that that has it caused any bias in the workforce? 
Has it improved the DEI efforts? So here I would like to hear from Brenna and then Nidhi and Simona. So Brenna, do you have something to say? Yeah, thank you. I think when it comes to working from home, a lot of the time it really relies on having a strong internet, right? So what it, it's kind of been tricky because um, like for me, where I grew up, we don't how we didn't have a lot of fast internet. Mm -hmm. So that definitely I feel like has impacted people's ability to work from home is if you live someplace where there's simply fast internet just doesn't exist, right? So maybe that means you can't support having teleconferences with videos on. Maybe that means that it's really patchy. And so something that I have seen is that certain organizations have been giving their workers Wi-Fi hotspots. So that's part of that equity, right, that we were talking about is how do you bring everybody up to that same level by giving them different types of help based on their situation. Um, I think it also has been tricky with now kind of we're moving into kind of maybe this hybrid workforce where we have some people working from home, some people working from the office. And there's really I think some concern as maybe that will create a situation where it's like the haves and the have nots, who's visible, who's not visible, and how do we kind of make that more equal? And I think right now it's just people trying to understand the concern and be like, okay, how can we address these things? And then step two would be, how do we implement that into our processes and our practices? So I think just even people being aware that this could impact DEIA, I think is, a big step up kind of maybe from where we were. And then I think just being able to work from home really helps people who have disabilities, right? Because maybe they're not feeling well enough to go into the office, but they're feeling okay enough to be able to work from home. So I think that's really a great way that, you know, we've been able to help people work from anywhere at any time um, and yeah. depend, you know, no matter their ability or their health status. So thank you. It's, it's given us so many insights, I believe. Nidhi, do you have something to say to that? And then Simona? Uh, I think Vena gave a fantastic answer. I, I do agree there was a lot of challenges during COVID, uh, especially for care providers, uh, care providers, uh, women care providers, who um, also had a, you know, a career. Uh, so there was a lot of things on their plate, but uh, I think what Brenna added uh, was fantastic. So I don't have anything else to say. Thank you, thank you. That was good. And also as a professor, we know the challenges to teaching students, right? That's a- Correct. That's so having internet, good. I think was such a big part of the uh, work right. from home. You still have to work and it has to be yes. from home. So uh, what do you really need is just internet. <laughs> and uh, Simona? A quick note that I would like to make is, um, I think uh, being out of the pandemic, uh, um, is quite beneficial for all of us. While we, uh, some of us enjoy teleworking, uh, I think uh, the need of uh, interacting with our colleagues, with our uh, 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 um, group members and having even these small conversations and learning about their background, their history or um, kind of, um, you know, uh, engaging with them, you know, is really beneficial to, to not only us as individual, but also for the company. So I think, uh, uh, you know, even for us, you know, uh, English as a second language, sometimes you have these team me teams meetings and, you know, uh, sometimes we don't feel as comfortable speaking up because, hey, my English is not perfect. I have a strong accent and people might not understand. So uh, not understand us, but uh, having that, you know, uh, 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 interaction at work, you know, uh, you feel better at uh, engaging with other people, not just from a technological point of view and creating uh, products or developing proposals, but also kind of um, getting to know your your colleagues and creating this camaraderie. I don't care if you are from Sri Lanka, I don't care if you are from China or from Romania, but uh, we learn about uh, our culture and we are better off if uh, we can understand each other. That's that's very, very true. So now it's the closing remarks. And I, I want to ask, also ask one more question. So I want to combine that together. So I'm just going to give you all no more than two minutes each. So what are some of the closing comments? And while you are discussing your closing comments, uh, can you also talk about what your organization is doing with respect to uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion? So here we start with Brenna, Simona, Nidhi. So Brenna, do you want to 
start? Yeah, thank you. I think, right, so you all saw my background and kind of what I choose to work on when I do have a little bit of spare time, apart from being a thermal engineer. So for, yes. for me, I feel like there's been a lot of focus being spent currently on hiring diversity, and I would love it if there's a little bit more emphasis on inclusion, right? So helping people feel like they found their place in your organization, so that helps with retention. It helps keep your talent from going out the door, so it really helps on your return on investment. Um, in terms of stuff that my organization is doing, uh, we do have, you know, those couple different groups that I've mentioned. We've looked at equity. Uh, I'm part of some efforts with AAPI stuff. And then um, just for me personally, I do a lot of like early career stuff. So I think for us, you know, being in this DNI realm, it's kind of not just to be a participant or to, you know, educate ourselves, but I think it also then it's on us to become advocates and, you know, say who's not in the room, who needs to be in the room. How can we elevate these voices? How do we reach more people, right? So that they get to use so that they get their voices heard and get input on some of these processes and stuff that gets created. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, what about Sibona? Because we've got lots of questions too. So if you can uh, yeah. keep it uh, short and then Nidhi, and then we'll, uh, we'll answer some of these questions. I yeah. would advise the audience to uh, never give up. We all have struggles in life and life is not perfect. Life is not fair, uh, but persistence, motivation and drive are the key factors to a successful career. So even if you don't have all the tools at hand, um, do not give up. And now uh, what we are creating and what you can create, you know, in the audience, if you are kind of seeking to, to uh, get your uh, corporation engaged into this, um, this uh, uh, goal of diversity and inclusion is uh, create organizations and initiatives, uh, engage and volunteer in the community, uh, mm -hmm. create lifelong mentoring and active mentoring initiatives to encourage mm -hmm. networking and stronger feelings of belonging among members. And also what we have here, uh, uh, generate periodicals and tutorials, training, um, and also highlight uh, people from uh, uh, with different backgrounds and expertise. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really good. Mentoring is key. So Nidhi, do you want to add something? And then I'll go to the questions. Nidhi? Sorry, I'm muted. Um, I'm muted. Um, yeah, excellent points by both Rena and Simona. And what I'm going to add is uh, just to remember that DEI is not uh, uh, something that only those who are uh, who's been you know um, uh, who, who are in who represent the minority or are, are underrepresented. It is something that everybody needs to address in whatever way they can. Uh, be it you don't have to necessarily become a part of a special group, just in your jobs, you can just be inclusive uh, and accepting and you know treat everybody as equal. Just that simple uh, change in attitude can have a long lasting impact on people. Uh, at least you will not be making anybody feel uh, you know, left out. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I do wanna say that, so there are two things, how I see is, um, addressing DEI in whatever ways you can, but at the same time, do not forget that what whatever jobs or whatever backgrounds you have, you still need to be really, really good at it. Uh, all said and done, you still need to excel. You need to at least be uh, average or above average in whatever you're doing. So have those blinders on, you have to focus, you have to uh, you know, continue performing well. Uh, in whatever you know uh, domain or backgrounds or, or 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 fields you choose to work in, uh, my my university I I see a very strong representation of women and diverse uh, people right to the provost and the dean uh, and uh, uh, there are more female professors being hired in my department so I see you know uh, really uh, them walking the talk. Um, and not just uh, having outreach programs, uh, but literally putting, uh, you know, uh, money where their mouth is. So action in several forms is going to make DEI uh, actually a successful initiative. 
That's, that's really excellent. So there are about five questions. And so uh, shall I, uh, Gary, shall I go ahead and ask these questions? Because I, I really want to get some of these questions uh, answered. And I'm going to ask only one person each of these questions. Okay. Yeah, we may have time for, for one question. Yeah, maybe, maybe if we can go a little, I mean, do we have to stop at 11 sharp or, sorry, 12? Okay, let, let's get started. So this question, I think I will ask, uh, let's see, uh, Simona. How was your experience in getting your first job offer as a professional after your PhD or other professional degree? So very briefly, Simona, can you can you answer? Uh, yes, so uh, I already was a postdoc at uh, Savannah River National Lab. So it was quite, uh, I would say in a way not easy because I was not a US citizen. So I had to wait for my citizenship in order for me to uh, uh, be a full hire at a national lab. So it was a struggle. I'm not going to, uh, to uh, sugarcoat it. I waited eight years to become a US citizen. So uh, of course that, that hindered my ability. However, like I said, do not, uh, do not uh, give up and continue to persevere because um, you know, um, it will happen sooner or later. That's, that's really good. And the other question I'm going to ask is, there was a question specifically for Simona and Brenna, but that might take time. So I want to ask this question to Brenna. What is the one thing you would change in organizations today to make, your contrib make you contribute more effectively to your profession? So how, what sort of support do you need from the organization? Brenna? So is this specifically like in terms of DEI or is it like kind of like in general for my oh, profession? This could be sort of more general which also, and because you're a woman, you know, DEI is part of it, right? Yeah, yeah. I think something that we haven't completely touched on, but maybe we were like mentioned kind of briefly was the idea of intersectionality, right? So for me, I exist at the intersection of being a minority, but also being female yeah. and kind of, you know, growing up in what most people consider as like in a rural environment. So I think just when it comes to DEI, it's not something you can kind of like sprinkle on the top at the end, of when you're creating this product, like, oh, right, we need to do this. I think as it, you know, has the others have mentioned, you really have to build in DE and IA from the ground up and it should be there every single step of your process because that's how you, you create these more robust programs and products. So that's, that's excellent. One last question, Gary, because it's really important. Uh, and this is to Nidhi. How to stay motivated when you see everyone around you get the better chances by some or some other way? please take up this question. So Nidhi, how do you how do you keep motivated? Somebody else is getting promoted. You are not. So could you please answer that question? This will happen. It has happened to, I believe, everybody in yeah. any profession, or even if you're not uh, choosing a profession, this is going to happen. Uh, but trust in your ability. And that's the only thing you can do. And not stop because or, or get deterred by you know, how things are shaping up for other people's life. Besides, you can never tell, you know, on the outside how things are uh, shaping up for other people. So don't get distracted by what's happening in others' life. Uh, that's not going to uh, lead to anything. So just focus on how you can improve yourself, how you can make, uh, how you can improve others. And, and, and trust me, that will help you a lot right. more. And, and, and I'd like to add very briefly, yeah. because I've had a, almost a 42-year career. and so many setbacks, you know, sometimes some things have been unfair, but I've always determined and very positive. Yes, there are sometimes you get a bit disappointed and, you know, I just sort of try to relax and meditate and sleep one night and next morning, a new day, and I get started really motivated. So never, ever, ever give up. And with that, uh, sorry, I, we can't answer all these questions. Uh, there are two or three more questions, but, uh, Hopefully you can email us or email uh, NYU and then he can, Gary can direct those questions. So I will now hand it over to Gary. Thank you again. And Gary, it's all yours. Thank you, Dr. Broughton. And uh, I'd like to give uh, thanks to all of the panelists today. And um, i also like to give special thanks to the National Science Foundation and NYU Center for Cybersecurity for sponsoring uh, these events, as well as the organizers uh, Professor Nikhil Gupta, Professor Ramesh Kerry, Professor Ahmed Pierce. The link to these webinars will be uh, recorded and posted on YouTube and shared with everyone. 
And uh, I hope we can all join again for our fourth panel uh, on July 14th, which will be a topic on digital manufacturing cybersecurity and international and commercial perspective. Uh, thank you all once again, and bye-bye uh, until next time. Thank you, and thank you, panelists. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.